been a long, long time. Welcome to Purple Elephant Radio, where we discuss the mindsets, philosophies, and strategies needed to make art and tell stories that make a dent in this era of abundance. This is a show for the unbound creative, the undefinable artists, and the unidentified philosophers. I'm your host, Sean Green. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to hear my own voice through these headphones. Maybe that's arrogant to say, but there's something very comforting when I was doing the podcast every week. Something about the preparation, the the whole mindset. I mean, you get into a a way of thinking when you're making a podcast consistently that I've lost these past nine, ten months. It's February 6th as of recording this, and my last podcast episode for Purple Elephant Radio released uh, sometime in July of 2022. So I almost made it a year. And really, I almost made giving it up altogether. And that's kind of what the, the major focus of this episode is on. You know, creative resistance. The one referred to in Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art. There's a couple aspects of that I want to get into, but... These past, really since the last recording, the months have been a whirlwind. Um, I moved out of my parents' house. I'm living in the city with my girlfriend. And you may hear some rustling in the background of this episode, which I'll do my best to edit out, but um, just know that's, that's her doing her thing. I released my last short film, uh, Fontanini Fontanini, on Christmas Eve. And really that had been the project taking up all of my excess creative time since the last episode of this podcast released. I was working on the script in July, filming in October, editing in November, and up until the final moment when I published that on Christmas Eve. And that that project I'll get into a little bit more in this episode, but that's kind of the, the catching you up on what I've been up to. And really, I guess the last thing I'll say is I switched work, so I was looking at the the podcast I had released after I graduated school, and the one about um, work life balance. I think that first one I released, episode forty nine. It's it's a little silly to go back to to see how far I've come. Is really this marks a year and two months since I graduated college and have been in the real world. And so I think when I made that first episode, it was, of course, it was premature to say, okay, I graduated school and now I know what to do. Here are the three lessons I learned. Here are the five things that anyone can apply. Of course, there was some level of that. But what I've come to realize with this big, big, long hiatus with Purple Elephant, specifically the podcast, is that really... I'm glad I made that episode. Just talking out loud, just getting those ideas, organizing my thoughts, that's the thing I've been missing. I've been missing it recently, but I've also been putting it off. And that leads really well into the main focus of the episode, resistance. Now, if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It's cheap, it's a short read, and it's one of those books that you can flip to any page and grab something from. <laughs> I mean, I, I love reading a couple pages of that in the morning and then sitting down to write on some projects that I'm not going to get into on this episode. But just know it's a really good source of creative inspiration. But the major theme of that book, or I should say the major antagonist of the book, is this thing called Resistance with a capital R. And I know I've mentioned it before, but... I, I really don't know what episode it was. I mean, I'm barely keeping track of the episodes I last released for this podcast. But whatever I said or didn't say about it, I want to treat it like a fresh new topic today. For me, avoiding this podcast has been a major form of resistance. This show, this Purple Elephant Radio, has been, or was, I should say, was the only thing I was sticking to consistently. 
in addition to some blog writing, but those kind of went hand in hand. And when I let this practice go, really it's been off and on for a while, but I want to say when that final episode released in July, there has been some level of existential disorganization in my life. I feel in many ways like I've lost my hunger, the hunger I used to shout from the rooftops, either on this podcast or the YouTube videos I used to make. That drive feels like I've lost it, but I mean, what I'm hoping to get out of this podcast, what I'm hoping to prove to myself, which I kind of knew in the back of my head all along, was that the act of creating this podcast, the blogs, the, the YouTube videos I used to make, and I'm not talking about short films, I'm talking about the purple elephant thoughts, but all those sources of content were not the expressions of my hunger. They were the thing that was making me desire, making me feel hungry. In a way, the act of talking about wanting desire and, and having all these goals, that was a thing that kept me accountable to them. And so I just kind of want to focus on these past, specifically the time since I moved into my new apartment until now, three and a half months, basically four months. And what has been going on? It's a question that's been rolling around in my mind, and I don't think I have a perfect answer for that. So with this episode being about resistance with a capital R, the one referred to in The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, I wanted to break it down into, I guess, three categories of thinking or really touch on three aspects of that thing because it is so all-encompassing that sometimes I think even just thinking about the word can become a little bit intimidating. So the first thing I wanted to talk about regarding resistance was this thing that has really dawned upon me recently, and it's called the creative progress trap. And I honestly don't think this was referred to in the book. I'm sure other people experienced this, but I have not really seen this idea anywhere. And the creative progress trap is this, essentially doing just enough, creatively speaking, whether that's writing, making music, um, you know, recording yourself, making content like this, doing just enough to convince yourself that you are that identity of the artist, the writer, the podcaster, but really not taking it seriously. Really, if you're being honest with yourself, it's just a form of half-assing it, just with just enough proof to deny the fact that you were no longer that identity or never were. So when it comes to writing, for me, I was consistently blogging every day. I've stopped that habit, but when I was kind of half doing it every day and then, you know, maybe I'll take a week off, maybe I'll take a couple days off. When I was blogging every so often and kind of letting the habit fall by the wayside, I was still convinced I was a blogger. And I was convinced I was a blogger up until I completely stopped doing it, which really came about as a result of writing the Purple Elephant artist book and just focusing on that. So it wasn't like I let it go for no good reason, but I still did let it go. And by the time I published that book, The Purple Elephant Artist, I couldn't say, okay, I'm still a blogger because I wasn't freaking blogging anymore. And the same thing happened with Purple Elephant Radio. For this current slash past season, season five, I sporadically posted five or six episodes and in that whole span of time, I still considered myself a podcaster. I didn't want to let this skill that I had learned, the skill of converting complicated ideas and, and bringing them vocally to you, I didn't want to let it go. And I think what really happened is I didn't want to let the identity of being this thought leader, you know, I cringe when I say that, but content creator, I didn't want to let that identity go. More so than, okay, I've got to post this because people are eagerly waiting for the next episode. And so when I stopped the last recording on July or in July, and I haven't done it since, I basically let the candle burn out. So I'm kind of giving you out of order the, the antidote to the creative progress trap. But let me just stick back on this idea, the creative progress trap a little bit longer. So there are two forms of the progress trap. The one I just mentioned, 
is essentially doing the minimum amount of work to convince yourself you still have this identity, but you're not actually making progress toward a specific goal. So let's say you're writing a page or two every week for your novel, but you have no deadline, no intention to finish the book. When it comes to music making, sure, you're working on a couple melodies, a couple songs, but you have no intention to make an album. Or if you do, you have no deadline. So that's one aspect of it. And the other one is something that recently happened with me was with my last short film, the Fontanini Fontanini movie. Um, it's currently on YouTube. If you're curious enough to watch it, um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. But I bring that up because that project was made with no intention, or I guess anti-intention, because I knew right away I wasn't going to be putting this and submitting it to film festivals. I'd kind of already decided that from the get-go so I could have ultimate creative freedom. And in many ways, I think that hurt me. In many ways, I completely ignored the idea of who am I making this for when I was writing the film, when I was filming it, acting in it. I just made it for myself. So it was a very selfish project, which inherently there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I published it. People got to see it. I brought it to fruition. I'm proud of that. But where this becomes an issue for me specifically is that I have made short films before. Yes, I learned a couple new techniques, but this was not a difficult project for me to pull off. Making films don't scare me. Short films are not a stretch for me to make. Yes, there were some specific skills I improved upon. I learned a ton about audio editing. But the whole process to go from script to final film that I can put on YouTube, none of it was new. So in some ways I stretched myself, but in many ways... By making this film, it was a form of resistance because I was ignoring the things that I was actually afraid of doing, the things with real world consequences, the things where an outcome matters, where I need to see a return on my investment, where I need to see reception from other people. And so in making that film and calling it art, I could easily say, oh, you didn't like the film? You don't get it. No one understands my my headspace, so it's only unique to me. And if you don't like it, you're wrong. Do you hear the resistance and the thoughts that, I mean, I guess it was a little bit unconscious that I was having these, but now that I've released the film and I'm able to reflect on it, that was what was going on. I was keeping myself in this little bubble of the thing I knew how to do and knew how to do it well and ignoring the, the real world things creating my own business, taking what I learned with videography and expanding that into something I can sustain myself without having to have another job. I've been ignoring all those things. So that is another form of the creative progress trap. And to summarize it very, very simply, it is taking the skill you already know and know how to do it well and spending all your effing time doing that because it's easy, because you don't have to stretch yourself, but Hey, you're still the artist because you are making a film. You are working on your album. You are doing this type of thing. But if you're being honest with yourself as the artist or the writer, you know when you're stretching yourself and you know when you're doing the same old shit, but just a little bit different. And I want to be very clear. I'm, I may be repeating this a lot, but I'm proud of the film. I'm proud of the people who worked on it. It was fun to make. I have really good memories from that film but it doesn't change the fact that it was a form of resistance. So that's one aspect of the resistance that I wanted to talk about today, the creative progress trap. The next aspect I wanted to talk about, and this is very, very relevant to me these past, really since I moved into my new apartment from November to now, is this idea of perfection. When we moved into the apartment, my girlfriend and I, I had this vision, I still kind of have this vision, of creating a perfect office space where I'm able to, you know, record myself and make content again and do podcasts. And you know what? Hell, I'll do a daily vlog again and I'll do all these things and work a full time job. And it never happened. I'm three months in. Yes, I have a desk. Yes, I'm recording this, but no, it is not what I originally envisioned. It is not the perfection that I wanted from. You know, looking at a couple Pinterest things, it doesn't have that 
perfect studio level quality that I originally imagined. And that was the thing that I kept telling myself was, okay, once I get it to this perfect quality, then I'll start recording videos. Once I buy all the different colored uh, photo papers, then I'll be able to record myself. The issue, which maybe it's redundant, maybe you've heard this a million times, but maybe this will be the time that sticks. But the issue with that thinking is that perfection is not only impossible, but it is essentially the most delusional thought that we as creatives can have when it comes to making a project. The mindset of once all my ducks are in a row, then I'll start working on it. Oh, and when, I'm gonna, when am I going to organize everything? Oh yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. And that thought goes on loop for three months and counting. I refer to this as kind of a perfection mindset, but there are a lot of nuances to it. Perfection doesn't always look like, well, something that we could admit to ourselves is perfection. More likely, it's something along the lines of, oh, I've got a big stack of books sitting on my desk and I can't start writing until I clear off that space. So we almost box in this idea of perfection and call it something else, call it reorganizing, call it buying that one thing. But really any of those things of avoiding doing the work, in this case, it's recording the podcast. In your case, it may be sitting down at a Google Doc and typing the fucking story or recording the fucking song, not doodling new thoughts in your notebook, but recording it. Things like that oftentimes will get held up by those mini perfection ideals. Yeah, what's the best way to put that? Mini perfection? Boxed in perfection? I like that. Boxed in perfection. So we don't say the world has to be perfect. We just say that one aspect has to be perfect before I start. And we usually have four or five of those things. So I mentioned the wanting my space to look like a perfect studio. But I have a couple more of those things. <laughs> I mean, this is a silly example, but I remember I was convinced that, okay, I'm not going to go to the gym until I have a new duffel bag to carry my gym clothes. I mean, I got the duffel bag, but I'm saying it applies in a lot of areas of life. But what's the antidote to perfectionism, at least in the sense that I'm talking about with those many perfect situations? Well, I really don't think there is a perfect antidote except, and you'll have to take my word for it now, but eventually when you start, you realize it, but doing the thing first before you get everything in order will make it so much easier to get everything in order. I know it seems a little strange to think that way, but it's essentially the thought that passion, that desire begins once you start, not before. And so whenever you know, you hear a famous person, whether they're an actor or a musician, talking about how much passion they have for the thing they do. What they often probably don't connect is the fact that they were doing the thing when they became passionate. Oh, they, they reverse engineer their origin story and when they were six, they loved theater or they loved singing. I would ask them, and I would ask you to ask yourself if you think this is true, but I bet they were doing the thing still. And if you boil it down, if you go all the way back into their childhood for those you know, people who were always passionate about their thing, someone probably showed them that skill, that thing, and they were okay about it. They didn't know anything about it, but they began doing it and then the passion was sparked. So for you, whatever your thing is, do it first and then the space clears itself your headspace and your environmental space. Things get organized, you get passionate once you start doing the thing. So that's this idea of perfection. The third and final aspect of resistance that I wanted to talk about in this episode, it's kind of a mixture of a couple things, but it essentially boils down to your why, which I know I've talked about before, but this is a definitely a different take and one that applies specifically to the resistance that is referred to in the War of Art book. And it essentially goes, your why, or the reason of doing that creative pursuit, is usually, almost always, going to be correlated with the thing that scares you the most. When I was a freshman in college, the thing that scared me the most, the thing that I couldn't imagine any more terrifying, was stand-up. 
And so my why for doing that and getting on stage and making a fool of myself and doing it a couple times was that it scared the shit out of me. And now that it doesn't scare me, I don't want to do it. It is no longer the situation of, I don't want to do this thing because it scares me, but I don't want to do this thing because it doesn't scare me. And usually if something doesn't scare you, it's going to bore you. And so this kind of goes back to what I said earlier about the creative progress trap. You know, making short films didn't scare me anymore. And I did it anyway. And the Fontanini movie became my form of resistance. So your why relates to what scares you. How do we get around that? I mean, of course, you can face the fear head on, but who wants to do that? Wouldn't you rather just listen to a podcast about someone talking about overcoming fear? Yeah, I know I do. I know I prefer that. I know I prefer reading 10,000 things about how to overcome fear than actually do the thing. I know I will take reading books, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, watching movies, any day over the week if it means I don't have to take action. And that has been my major issue. And the reason it's taken me this long to sit down and record another episode of Purple Elephant Radio. And so my closing note, my antidote to doing the thing that scares you, doing all this, making, taking action, not deluding yourself that the thing you thought was the creative project is actually not because it doesn't scare you anymore. My antidote to all of this is action pronto. Action immediately. Do the thing right now. No, I did not want to record this podcast episode today. No, I don't even have a script typed out. That's what I normally require of myself before I sit down and record it. But it's been too fucking long. This has been me overcoming my resistance to this podcast. I will see you soon and probably on video. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, it would mean a hell of a lot if you rated it on Spotify, on iTunes, left a nice review. Thank you.